Sarah Bréon, and the one who's co-organizing Meetup's Blockchainers, Switzerland, <coughs> in Geneva. Today, we are having uh, ODEM. ODEM is an uh, Andaman platform, and the goal of ODEM is to get and share and have, um, how do we say, affordable education for everyone. I'm relatively new to the blockchain space. Uh, I've only been with ODEM for three months now, but uh, really getting a lot of enthusiasm seeing what is uh, coming out here in the future. But today's main focus is definitely educating people on how blockchain can really benefit a lot of areas uh, in society and business. Um, there's been a lot of misrepresentations of it. So our goal today is kind of to allow for discussion to integrate more people to get involved in the space. Um, I'm sure everyone knows blockchain started um, about late 2000s, um, by an anonymous figure, Satori. Um, it's kind of interesting because blockchain has kind of uh, supported that anonymity. So to have someone create it and then not be taking credit for it is a, is a great accomplishment, I think. Um, so the idea is to take back the person's ownership of their data. So having your records on there, having your credentials, um, also having your monies there in a safe place where you can be the one to distribute it as you would like. Um, this allows, uh, this process um, will allow people to define consensus algorithms for groups based on a common good and interest. So meaning you can't have a transaction with someone unless you both agree on the principle and uh, complete each task with that. So it creates a sense of trust. <coughs> Uh, which is really important when you're doing business, obviously. Uh, and a great thing too is it uh, eliminates intermediaries. So you don't have to deal with banks, you can just deal with a peer-to-peer transaction. Um, one of my favorite things about it is how quickly it is. So dealing with business on a global scale, you don't have to wait for banks to clear checks, it's almost instantaneous. So I think that's definitely a, a huge benefit to businesses integrating blockchain. Um, providing data ownership that is mathematically secure, nearly impossible to brute force attack on a title claim. So it's a pretty fail-safe way to protect your investments, and it's pseudo-anonymous, um, partly. And it's financially sound record keeping, audible transactional claims, software defined network capacity. Um, so now we're gonna get into the myths, and I think this is really important when you're trying to educate someone who has no idea what blockchain is. <coughs> Um, so this is kind of the main focus of my presentation today. So the myth is blockchain is best for criminals. Does anyone agree with that? I don't think so. <laughs> so I found a really great quote um, from David Murray. It says, it's true that decentralized and anonymity are particularly nice features for criminals, but they're also great features for law-abiding citizens who are in an economically or politically unstable environment. If you are unable to trust local banks with your money due to corruption, or if your country has the possibility of destabilizing, is arguably the best place to keep your money. So it's a nice, safe, secure place for people to keep their investments. And next slide. There is only one blockchain. So blockchain is the technology, and there's actually multiple distributed ledgers of technology. So Bitcoin was obviously the first. Ethereum has built on that and has gained traction. Uh, IBM's Hyperledger, Horda, public and private, open and closed sources. So these are the different types of blockchain. Public, everyone can see all their transactions. Federated, limited number of nodes participate in consensus. And private, which is usually for internal companies um, who grant access to select users. Uh, this is my favorite. Blockchain equals Bitcoin. So, a lot of people have this notion that blockchain is Bitcoin. So blockchain is the underlying architecture for Bitcoin. So it's the platform which Bitcoin runs on. Because blockchain technology is used in bookkeeping for Bitcoin, many people equate the two or believe that blockchain is only one used in the cryptocurrency world, which is false, obviously. Yes, both technologies orig originate together, but today cryptocurrencies are just one of the many applications that can be run on top of blockchain. Is everyone with me so far? Um, and this is great too, because this kind of shows everyone what blockchain is capable of, of being included in, in these different uh, features. 
So if we look, securities, um, crowdfunding is a huge one, obviously. Uh, we're also seeing countries include that in their election process. So voting can be uh, completely secure. No one can hack into it and tamper it. Um, and then digital currencies, obviously, where it originated. So healthcare is definitely going to be reformed by blockchain. It's going to keep everyone's records in a concise place and also allow for their history to be viewed. Um, real estate can possibly be transformed. You're going to be um, getting rid of the intermediaries. So uh, banks won't, or lawyers won't be included in title claims. Uh, it can be a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Uh, and then we get into digital identities. So a lot of misplaced people uh, lost their credentials or have no way of proving um, their work history. Um, this could be a great way for blockchain to capture all that information and have it verified. And I see this a lot. You see a lot of startups come up and it's the big solution for everything. Blockchain can be used for everything. It can be applied in a lot of different applications, but I wouldn't say it's the solution for everything. So blockchain has many applications, but it's not a solution to everything. Lim limitations on scalability makes it so there is a need to be, excuse me, there's need to be many types of blockchains for different purposes. Um, it's a transparent ledger that is easily verifiable and allows for faster than bank transaction clearing and builds transaction trust. So that immediate transaction is a Now we get into uh, Odom. So Odom started in 2017, and um, it's one of the few blockchain-based companies that has provided a solution to a problem and is actually in the process, real time, in solving that issue. So our primary goal is to make education more affordable, easily accessible, and verifiable on a global scale. So. A lot of people, their main reason they don't go to university or college is they can't afford it. So our goal is to help students have access to those resources that were, up until this point, really exclusive. So they can get that business administration certificate from a professor at Harvard. Or they can have a, an engineering class at MIT. So they can have these micro degrees hosted on the blockchain and they're gonna have that at their palm of their fingertips to show employers, I have these credentials um, and it's gonna be a verified uh, service and there's no way that people can manipulate that. Uh, so again, it's gonna eliminate the cost of intermediaries. So it's gonna kind of disrupt the university's traditional route of education. So it's gonna be a peer-to-peer -peer based uh, solution. So you can take classes with that professor in real time and have you know, uh, a smaller, more intimate setting. You know, it's not gonna be an online course, it's actually gonna be uh, an in-person. So this allows students to expedite their careers because they're gonna know in real time what their industry is asking for them. Um, and again, they're gonna have access to these universities. So a precursor to Odom was Accelerators. And Accelerators is uh, a company that specializes in those courses. So they have um, people from, executives from China, students from China coming over and attending classes at MIT and getting those certificates to take home with them, a physical copy. So Odom's plan is to actually move all that onto blockchain. Um, and uh, just some of the use cases we have, we're going to have a staking process. So that's going to allow for students to, if they have a desire for a course, they can actually put money down and stake a course and say, I want to learn about artificial intelligence. So professors are going to be logging onto this platform and they're going to see, okay, there's 300 students in Zoo that want to learn about artificial intelligence. So I'm going to create this program and uh, find a location and uh, execute that program for the students. So it's really limitless in what people uh, want to learn about, you know, and gain knowledge through. So that's just a small part of what Odom's doing. Um, I can go into greater detail, but if we look here, we have the institution, they're kind of like the key holders. They're providing, you know, the services with the teachers and the coursework and the curriculum. 
So what Odom wants to do is they want to unlock that and they want to allow students to have access to all those uh, courses and kind of create their own micro degrees. And then at the end, they're going to get their certificate, they're going to have it in their wallet, and again, they can go to employers and, and show verified uh, certificate. And I think at this time, we're going to begin our panel discussion, unless there's any questions I can perhaps answer to anybody. How of them will deal with university and work closely? with university to issue the certificates for students on the blockchain? So as I mentioned before, Accelerators has already created this contact list of professors. So they have agreed to um, execute these programs. And these certificates are going to say, you know, uh, Sara has a certificate <coughs> in business management from Professor Chris Yeagle, professor at Harvard. It's not going to be a physical copy of a Harvard certificate. It's going to be a uh, verified and uh, accredited course to that professor. So, I have a question. So, um, what, I guess this is towards where you were going. Uh, you, it seems to me what you want to do is create, or where you're trying to go, is to create a network effect. So as part of matriculating in, a, in an institution, this would be part of the registration process that uh, upon completion of X course or, or degree in the diploma, that uh, the financial or whatever metadata format would be uh, issued and, and, and put an issue on, on, the, on the blockchain itself, uh, such that when a person wants to show that, not just the PDF file, they're actually showing what this is the institution that is doing those professors. That's my Right, so a lot of times... Working when, with institutions. In yeah, well, you, you know, when you request a transcript, a lot of times there's, there's a fee. That's you know? correct. And then with employers, too, a lot of people put down their credentials, but sometimes it happens that employers don't verify that. They're going on... I, I see, no, I, I'm with yeah. you on this. Okay. It's just more, it's more how you're working together with institutions and developing... With universities mm -hmm. yeah. closely. Do you want to jump in on this, Joanna? Sure, I'll just like this that question because it is a complicated one. Um, how we're working with institutions is very interesting because in the beginning, I mean, first of all, when you hear the term disruptive, it doesn't necessarily mean or need to mean, you know, breaking things apart that are already there. But it can mean a new path in parallel that kind of invites a new way of doing things. So with institutions, what we're doing now is we're taking our traditional programs that Ethan mentioned that we do with our sister company, Accelerators, which provides short-term programs at universities like Harvard on the campus there or MIT, and we're augmenting that process now with a digital certificate to start, you know, start that process where we're we're moving into the blockchain realm. So, so we're we're partnering with the professors of the universities. Mm -hmm. We're 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 holding the events on the campuses of the universities, but. Um, we're not, I mean, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're talking to some universities right now about actually putting their diplomas and credentials that are coming out of the universities on the blockchain. That'll probably be the first step. So, yeah, that's where I was going. And yeah. That, uh, you know, I actually am aware of the MIT program. We had an experiment yep. uh, last yep. uh, November, December, with, yep. with the students doing the MLS, I think, and we're able to do work with the students in there. It's very interesting. Yeah, and that's that's that I think is the direction that that's why I was asking. The yeah, yeah, that, and it's a good lead-in to get. I mean, and I think what Ethan is talking about here with the myths, I think, yeah. is a great. This is like a twofold kind of presentation because really, uh, it's about getting people to experience blockchain and understand it. And even the big universities need some kind of introduction to feel like it, it has value. That's right. So, yeah. Right. yeah. So it is a brand new territory. Um, this. Obviously, it hasn't really been utilized yet, so it is a process, and it is a, a company that we're building, you know, each day. And hopefully, within the next two to three years, we're going to see uh, an exponential growth in that. So, yeah. Any other questions I can maybe yeah. answer? Yes. Uh, probably, I guess the, 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 some of the things you're switching between uh, the universities um, serve as something, and the professors serve as something. Right. So, so where is that just actually let's 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 break it up there and serve as something on blockchain that's a priority. Who holds that priority? 
some process within the university for the professor. It's going to be the student, right? The student is going to own that that certificate. Right. And the, the, the professor is going to be issuing that. Yes. So that could be a, that could be a multi-state contract. So you could have the university holding the private key and a professor holding the private key, and then the student at Seton is saying will ultimately hold the private key to get the access. Right. But to sign it, yes, the private key would be held by either the institution or the educator of the college. Sure. I did work with a lot of professors in the past and from, from just sitting next to them while they enter the chapel, I, I know, well, for, for the chapel of every of them, I know it. Um, <laughs> professors are typically not at all security citizens. That's, that's just not in their, in their mind because uh, what they do that they do is, is going to be power, public knowledge. Anyways, they have not much to hide. Uh, so giving them the private key to certify something for a student uh, seems like a thing to do. Yeah, so we won't actually give them the private key. I mean, technically, they would be the ones to log in and sign on behalf of the private key. But we do have a user interface that will protect them from actually having to manage the private key and access. So you will be the one I think, yeah, I think initially we will be until we get, you know, and again, I think the direction is um, also an assumption, okay, not if, if put MIT aside, but other universities uh, where you, there's an assumption of what the background is of, of, of the, the institution itself and mm -hmm. given professors because there may be some upskilling and so forth that's required in this process. Yeah, it's going to be a process where universities start joining, and I think you'll see the growth of that. But not everyone's going to jump into this uh, right yeah. away. But I, but I will say this because I work on the other side of the house. This is a big deal when you've lost it because of tragedy, earthquakes, war. That becomes interesting. Nicholas, yes. Uh, what happens to the certificate if I lose my a great question. <laughs> uh, I'll just address that. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Somebody brought up this issue in our one of our last presentations, and uh, if 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 Odom is holding your private key for you, obviously that's you know that's outside of the realm of having you having to worry about that. And I think what's going to happen, and I will I won't speak for our chief technology mentor who is not here, but I think the process is going to be an adaptive one where we probably in the beginning will hold the keys and then as users, you know, if you know, if it turns out in the in the process that it makes sense to give the private keys directly to either students or educators or other stakeholders in the system, you know, we, we may allow for that. But in the beginning I think that Odom will hold the private keys in, you know, especially with educators because like you're saying, or institutions and we'll have a system that will probably allow for some co-ownership or co-management of that. So you know there is a there is sort of a backup method to to help protect that. So does that answer your question, Jared? <laughs> okay. To some extent, yes. The 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 rest of them, such a better mechanism in terms of the is kind of. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated issue, and it's actually as as everyone I think here knows who's really familiar with the, the the dilemma is you know the more control you give somebody, the less safety they have if something happens. And so when you're talking about a community like professors <coughs> who are not going to be super savvy about the blockchain model, you want to sort of protect them from themselves in the beginning, but then find ways ultimately to uh, you know to empower people with the private keys if that's where things end up kind of naturally migrating to once we start opening the system to more and more people. So, so how do you ensure that the student who uh, takes the course is really the student? Um, 
So we're going we're gonna to have, before students actually take a course, they're going to go through a verification process and sign up on the Odom platform. It would be similar to like a KYC process or a, you know, a verification process, just like if you're signing up for a, you know, a, a, an exchange account. So um, and one, of the, one of the efforts we actually have underway is, the, is something called um, ITE. It's one of our use cases. It's, um, it's identity through education. So we're working with like displaced populations like refugees. We have one project in particular we're working on right now where we will go into the community and find verified sources, other people who can actually verify that that person graduated from a particular university um, and then take that data to somebody who can professionally verify it and start rebuilding those people's identity. But ultimately, at the beginning, we're going to have to find some key identifiers to know that the student is who they say they are, and then they'll be able to build on that. So they can take one certified course, like Ethan is illustrating, you know, maybe on the campus of Harvard, then they can add to that, you know, maybe they go to the West Coast and they take a program at Berkeley, or they take some kind of independent, uh, you know, course outside of a university and all of that, the good thing is get they own all that data and can get added to their Odom blockchain. So So I'll, I'll give you an example of a project we're doing. I, I can't give you the, the full name of everyone involved, but we're working with a major auto company to actually create a specific uh, certificate for self-driving vehicles. So let's say you graduated with an engineering degree from NYU, right? And you decide you want to, or you know, uh, uh, you want to become uh, employed by Google or some you know large auto you know company. Uh, to help them design self-driving vehicles. What Odom will do is we will find the kind of, in the ecosystem of other engineers, we'll be able to kind of do a staking model to find out who else besides you would be interested in taking that course, find enough people to fill the course, bring the professor in, and create a very specific tailored model that is, that is almost requested by an employer to help you get a job in that industry. Does that make sense? That makes a little bit of sense. So basically what you said is your your professor you get your certificates from your professor, but my question was because the most important thing is money. Right. So, right. So that's why part of the the triangle for Odom is is the students, it's the educator and the institutional education, but it's also employers because employers are a key component to actually making your education have value. So by getting the input from employers like major car dealers, or I'm sorry, car companies, or Google, or Uber, who are saying, you know, wow, we have a huge demand for self-driving vehicle engineers. Can you, Odom, create a program for us? Or can we put out a bid to say, like, how many of your students, you know, in your network would take this course if this professor at Stanford, for example, were to offer it. So we're, we, we are completely aware that the idea for having an education is great, but ultimately what you want to do is be employable. And so that's where I think creating new flexibility and new models of education, which we're doing, is going to really serve students ultimately. And there's even an idea with Odom that you would get paid to go to school. So if an employer can say, I really need people who are skilled in this, and I'm willing to pay even to look at whoever you have and look at their data, you would get paid in, you know, Odom tokens to have somebody view your credentials and then potentially get employed by them. So you guys work directly with big companies? That's the idea, yeah. We're work, we have several kind of um, projects we're in, in discussions with and in agreements with, with companies who will be working directly with Odom to find the right professors and then bring even bring the talent in 
um, in the beginning to, to kind of make that match all happen. So, so one last question, and then we go for the panel discussion. So that's a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll answer this last one either, but yeah. we, have a, we have a model that we call the currency agnostic settlement system. So because we're designing all of our own smart contracts and because the, of the volatility in the crypto world, we want to be able to control what, you know, what goes through our platform and be able to program it. So we're using the Odom token exclusively from end to end on any of our contracts and any of our, you know, so terms and conditions say for, a, 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 you know, a program at Harvard will get met We'll get the professor to want to, to like present it to the community and then the students would stake a deposit to say that they're going to attend it and then, and then the, the program would get like completed and certificates are issued and then everyone gets paid. But if you're a student, you could actually come in through an exchange or some other third party and you can use whatever currency you want. And then as a professor or an educator, you can get paid in whatever currency you want. But inside of the model, it's all done with the Odin token. What's the benefit of that is why we're staying with this stable coin or any currency? Well, it's not a stable coin, but we want to try to stabilize it as much as we can. And we want to try to have some, um, because it's a utility token, I mean, obviously we're, going to, we're, we're, we're struggling with the same issues everybody else in the community is struggling with. You know, we can't control the price of our token completely, but we can have some influence in how we manage our smart contracts, how quickly they're executed. And, you know, so there's, there's, those are all the dilemmas I think we're all dealing with. So kind of more of a bit strange job from, from this, um, having a, a own token in your system. Yeah, it's probably an old analogy, but I don't necessarily buy an Amazon gift card before I buy something I don't know. I don't want to pay whatever currency I'm already using. Right. So there is not a, a real obvious additional benefit um, of your one, which cannot be facilitated um, without uh, uh, what is the need? Uh, stability, sure. Right. Uh, but you would have, I mean, uh, essentially, uh, your client would have competed with, say, Ether, mm -hmm. the Ethereum blockchain, which has uh, so much higher market cap that the, that the uh, potential for volatility on that would be much, much lower than your token. Right, right. And you know, this is stuff we're going to have to like explore, and it's going to be like getting into the trenches and actually doing it. But ultimately, you as the user, it doesn't matter to you that it's Odom token. It's not going to be, when you buy an Amazon gift card, when you're getting ready to make a purchase, this would be a similar thing. I mean, you would buy your Odom tokens, and maybe you won't even know you're buying Odom tokens, but you would be saying, I'm going to put a deposit down for this program in whatever currency suits you. And then maybe the obvious one is, will you be doing an ICO with this Odom token? We, are, we already have. Okay, yeah. amazing. So All now right. let's get a lot of panel discussion. Uh, first, Johanna. Oh, I'm not done. I, have a, I still have a question quickly for Johanna. Could you please remind me? I mean, you've done your ICO earlier this, yes. with this year, okay? Uh, what is uh, or when do you think your platform will be? So we will be opening a live beta, a live, I'm sorry, a live alpha, where we're kind of doing things in a little reverse order. We're actually doing a closed beta currently, and that means we have some clients we're working with that are using the, the product, but it's not open to the public. We will be offering a live alpha of the product at, in February. So that will be when, when students and educators, anybody from the public will be able to log in and use the platform. So. Amazing. Thank you. Let's go for the panel discussion. First, I will be the moderator. I've been working in the financial private bank industry since 10 years in Geneva. I'm also working a lot with some startups as advisor and also with all them since just like beginning of the month as a CFO. So let me introduce you to the panel. I would like you please all um, to introduce first yourself, uh, who you are, what you are doing, your company, and also uh, since when you are a uh, blockchain, I would say passionate or not. I don't know. Um, we should, with team, I'm sorry, yeah, or with women first. 
Emmy. <laughs> My name is uh, Emmy, and uh, I work for Shapeshift. I started uh, with Shapeshift in January this year, and I was responsible for uh, for the customer support team and taking care of uh, of the general management uh, positions here in uh, in Tug, uh, where our headquarter is. And as of September, uh, I'm in business development. Monique? Oh, okay. So, Monique Morrow, and I'm president and co founder of a Swiss based nonprofit called the Humanized Internet. We're based actually in Zurich. And our, my focus, our focus is around this, this notion of digital sets of identity and how you are so in control, but or should be in control, actually. Um, I am very, very focused on the refugee community having been in Jordan. And so I have a, a use case that we've been working on for some time. And I'm pleased to announce that as of today, we are MIT SOL finalist 2018, one of the finalists, 15 finalists in the healthcare healthline uh, group. Yes. So a group of, of us will be in New York uh, September 21st to the 24th which is corresponds to the UN National uh, General Assembly, opening of the UN General Assembly, so we're really thrilled to be here. Amazing. It's a very important space. <laughs> now, Dr. Professor, um, Dr. Tim Van Gangnam. Yes. Yeah. Hi, so I'm working at the University of Applied Science Lucerne, um, and we're in Rotkreuz, the canton of Tug. Um, um, yeah, we, I think, since 2016, we're uh, heading up or uh, also building up uh, educational programs, starting with uh, continuing education and now in the education program, uh, doing research projects in the blockchain area. So that's one of my um, topics. And also, uh, I'm responsible in the, in the innovation park uh, we have in Rotkreuz. Cadence is in the left. So I'm Ben Walker. Um, I have been in the blockchain space, I don't know how long, uh, some time. So it's uh, been exciting so far. We also started with education, um, doing a lot in that space, educating what is blockchain, smart contracts, how does it work. Um, we build blockchain solutions, we help academics to educate the students, and we have also a research department one person, but still we have one. Um, and um, we are basically doing a lot of uh, research in analytics, forensics, and how blockchain can be used in, um, in, in, uh, in different industries on the academic uh, side of it. What can it do better? Not, not for financial work, but like how can blockchain make an impact in, in um, research and science? Amazing. And you uh, Ethan Stouts, I'm the event manager for Odom, so my responsibility is um, having Odom attend conferences globally, uh, sponsoring sponsorships and partnerships, and just creating more awareness um, for our brand with you guys. I'm Johanna. Uh, yes, I'm the, the COO of Odom. I like to call myself the integrator. Um, I'm responsible for just making sure everybody on the team has what they need from anybody else on the team, and then things just uh, kind of fit together. <laughs> Amazing. So now let's uh, begin the discussion. Um, the first question will be, everything's written behind you, right? So blockchain can be implemented in numerous applications. What makes it a fundamental component for business moving forward? Maybe, Monique, you can um, answer for this first question. Or let me, let me see if a uh, numerous application, well, okay. Right, um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Andre for hosting this event. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. You're welcome. Thank you. The pizza is still going to come. Still going to come. <laughs> well, look, you have, you have to understand when you want to use uh, blockchain. I think this was an earlier discussion. I, you know, we were talking about multiple organizations. Do you trust them? Um, how, how are you going to use uh, a blockchain? Whether it's uh, supply chain is a big, big topic now um, in, in the space. Uh, having uh, met with some people in the supply chain field, that's a huge topic. How do you have provenance of, uh, of, of, of the goods? Uh, I also looked at, uh, worked with somebody in uh, shipping, which is very complex. You know, the bill of lading and then what becomes law. Very, very interesting space. Um, so you can go into the pharmaceuticals, we can go into interesting space around genomics and smart medicine, what you want to put 
how you want to use it from the uh, medical and healthcare f facility. For example, who do I give keys to? Estonia is actually in this space. Um, who, which doctors do I trust and which doctors do I not trust? And of course, education is, is interesting. I mean, the sky is a limit in terms of the, 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 the broad sets of applications. It's, uh, you know, this is an opportunity in the industry to actually make sure that we're all on one page and we understand the underlying sets of technologies that actually fuel. It's, I think the analogy is, and it's an off, often made analogy is that, uh, you know, we, early internet days, you know, you're talking about uh, when people uh, t talked about email, uh, people, there was this fear that uh, the post would be put out of business. Um, it's, it, you know, you're dealing with altern alternative systems here. Uh, and the cat is already out of the bag, so you can't hide it. And so it's an interesting opportunity to do some good work. Anyone wants to jump in? On the answer or from the panel? I mean, that's your from Monique. Monique, you didn't say financial services. Did well, I mean, well, I, I, no, no, I mean, I, I could have gone on, right? Yeah. Because financial services is always the first, I mean, it's been sort of the first, I mean, you can go into transportation and driverless cars. It's the first, it was the first obvious set as. Um, I guess use sets of use cases with ultimate payment systems and, and, and so on and so forth and uh, certainly that becomes a, 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 when I talk about payment systems or settlement systems and, 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 and so on. I think it's interesting to watch what the banks are doing I think it's really interesting to watch what the central banks are doing and what the IMF is doing. I think it's also interesting to look at regulatory tech. Uh, we have to work with, uh, we were talking about this I think earlier as a talk, as subject that you have to work with tech uh, uh, regulators, but in a tech way, so that you have a sort of enough sandbox to, to play. Because the fact of the matter is, the law is an interesting space. Uh, and what is, uh, what, when you have a long, law, long reach of jurisdiction, um, it becomes all interesting because people do not know what that is they're regulating. That makes sense. Absolutely. Great. <laughs> Speaking of regulatory governments, um, how do we say, policies, I would say, um, so this does not help the citizens uh, to have a very good perception of blockchain. So in a sense, Amy, uh, what do you think um, government or, I mean, what could enhance or erase this neg negative perception so then people, citizens get more into uh, or know better blockchain? And crypto. I think what has to happen is uh, is we have to make sure that we educate uh, everyone. So this is why I think Shapeshift is doing, doing a really good job that we not only on the educator users on on their on the issue what they what they ask or like let's say when they use their platform for a transaction. Uh, we don't only help them to respond on the specific issue, but we help them to understand the bigger picture and then to learn about the crypto space in general. Um, I think the various use cases will show and then if we think of which projects have been really delivered what they promised on uh, prior their ICO, um, I don't know of how many can you think. Uh, how but many on examples? ICOs, just sign ICOs, ICOs. Eighty-one yeah. percent are fraud. Correct. Eighty-one percent. Wow. So, get a great lawyers who understand this space. That's why eighty-one percent. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's it's. I I would like to highlight education yeah. uh, and. Um, and making people aware of uh, of how to uh, trade uh, when they are trading, how to uh, store their digital assets, and uh, and we should go into the direction where we have less and less fraud happening. Uh, so people won't be afraid of of looking into the space and actually uh, learning more about the space. No. Um. As um, I mean, the mass adoption of all I mean, this it educated people. If we get more educated people into the blockchain, then of course we have like mass adoption. But 
my, I mean, I have just a comment, is actually and currently we all know that there is a lack of regulation or answer directly from the government. So my question here is um, how can we enhance and have a uh, government uh, answering to, to all those uh, I would say, or yeah, to all those lack of regulation that will help um, fintech startups um, to create their, uh, I would say, their blockchain or their solution, their product. Um, maybe, Tim, you have an answer? Well, sure. Um, I think, on the one hand side, government government has to, well, has to want to uh, to jump into it. Uh, they they really have to um, have an interest in. Um, providing these rules and um, I think the, the way it's working today is that uh, we just uh, make some facts so that all these projects just start and they uh, deliver some um, results, they deliver some projects, so some working applications and then uh, there will be some cases of fraud, of, uh, of negative press and then somebody's calling for government uh, to jump in to make some regulations and yeah, that's painful, but it has to work like this. You, so you, you won't be able to just make first all the rules and afterwards live in happiness. So you have to go this valley of yeah, <laughs> tears. <to> take, <laughs> people, you have to take uh, one, one, one point to make here. Um, you know, it's really great that we're here, but you have to really take all of your parties and actors on a journey. Um, so whether it's uh, FINMA in Switzerland or uh, whatever your your favorite SEC or, or whatever, you have to take your your actors on a journey because I think where, where Tim is going is that if you're not careful, you can over over regulate and for something you're not sure of what it is you want to regulate. So. And if I could just add a comment to that, I think we're on. You know what I like to refer to this as if we're all kind of on the space shuttle. You know we're, we're really this is never. On so many levels, this has not been done before. And so, um, you know, the question about our, is, it, is uh, you know, Oda being a stable coin, or not, and it's not a stable coin. And, uh, I think that if you look at the ecosystem of Ethereum, realizing that it's only been used really for ICOs and crypto kitties, and like there's just very little new stuff coming out, um, we are going to have to, it is going to be an adventure bringing your, your kind of stakeholders along and your participants along to just see once you start, once you activate these, these applications, we, we still don't really know what will be the kind of turnout of that and what will be some of the, the you know, I don't know what you call them, side effects or what, I mean, there's just going to be a lot of things that we don't know from human behavior how it's going to be embraced or, or just one point to add, um, Johanna, is that I had the pleasure of meeting, I was on a pa um, panel with Chris Toskin, uh, Hoskinson, who is one of the founders of Ethereum and also Cardano, and uh, one of the points that he was making, uh, this was three weeks ago, we were talking about, specifically to Ethereum, by the way, was this whole notion about what governance looks like, and we're only 20% there, right? So, I mean, we, uh, I asked him for a hard number, and you ask a scientist for a hard number, a cryptographer, he will or she will give you that number. So he said 20%. So we have a ways to go. <coughs> yeah. A lot educated, educate people to probably have like only one token or crypto can also enhance the discussion probably with currencies because then that we don't have the choice then to accept the blockchain and the crypto coin, I would say. So um, next, Maybe let me just add yeah. something to that. Okay. So I think um, something which is also as important is not only the education, which is one major part of my opinion. And I think there is uh, you are the wrong person sitting on this panel because you are representing uh, an a university, one of the very few that actually doing something like in space. But many universities don't, that's right? Okay. So that's one yeah. point which has to be very very clear that education or mass adoption can only happen actually if you have a lot of schools. I mean, have you ever seen? Uh, somebody talking about blockchain technology to kids today? Nope. So that's where it starts, right? So we grow actually people that come to university already make that choice what they want to study. Uh, so we actually have to start very early. Why is that not happening? 
It's a very simple question. It's because the technology is not there. It is not user friendly. Did you ever try to explain private public keys to your grandma or to mom? Yeah. I did. I feel miserable. <laughs> it's, it's seriously, it's not easy. You know, like go and, and, and have a talk with people and trying to explain to them the notion and, and basically show them like jacks or you know any or shapeshift for that matter is pretty simple still, but try to explain to set them up a wallet. You know how many times my, my mom actually already erased her, her, her wallet? Well, obviously I have made that guy. But, but the point is like it, before we're not there that this actually becomes, you know, like user friendly that we have an easy way to use this technology, this cannot become mass adoption. And that refers to the point, we are very early in the stage at 20%, um, so that just will take a few years before mm -hmm. you know, the technology is actually right, or some other technology takes over that we all see as something that is the basis of what we can build on. But do you think that is more or less, I would say, the, world of, uh, the, the, the work soul, sorry, of the startup to do it? Because for instance, I mean, just to have like a, I would say, a front-end kind of platform solution to have this uh, user-friendly for, I mean, all the citizens. Because, um, for instance, we are all doing. Even my my mom, my grandma, my kids also are doing kind of some transaction uh, on e-banking, um, e-banking uh, online I mean, from their bank, but they do not know what's happening behind the scene. But at the end, they know that the money is coming from point A to point B because they do initiate that transaction, for instance. So is it the, the work of the startup to get like more friendly um, application for everyone? Affordable, so like education, like uh, for everyone? I think it's for, for anybody who comes in the space and, and says to himself, I want to do something, you know? So if it's an educator or comes, he has to for his part to make sure and somebody comes to I build your eyes in that space, then obviously it's his responsibility too. I mean, whoever comes into the space and, and tries to do something, change something, build something, will you know, put his chair into you know, trying to, to put something towards the goal. Okay. Um, next question. Um, Jean-Claude, you have a question. Who is my next uh, victim? <laughs> um, how will uh, blockchain impact the future, Johanna? Uh, I think, I think... For the future uh, workforce, sorry. Yes. How will blockchain impact the future workforce? Yeah. Um, I think this young man right here had a great question, and I, I think that one way that blockchain can influence the workforce in the future is there are, I don't know any of the statistics, but the number of jobs that are not filled um, in, let's just say, the self-driving vehicle industry is are enormous. I mean, there's uh, last I checked, there's only one official program in the United States at Carnegie Mellon where you can get a degree where you actually have that expertise. So I think that um, while there's a lot of unemployment on the planet, there's also a lot of un, kind of like unmatched opportunity. And I think the blockchain, uh, it, uh, looking at workforce or workforce as a supply chain is going to greatly impact that. And I think that's something where Odom, you know, as we're moving out into building more relationships with employers as that third leg, which we talked about in, on the stool of like, you know, students, educators, and, and employers, that we can have employers have more influence over what students are learning and therefore, you know, creating a better path of employment for, so students aren't just coming out of a four year university when they don't even know where to start to find a job. I mean, I have, I have two kids in college right now who are both graduating from a great university in the spring, and they're, they're, they're both nervous about, you know, how are they, you know, where, did, where are they going to land? And I think that's going to be changed. So. Um, just as a, an example for everyone, I mean, um, in Souk, since the, 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 the state is more crypto, is crypto friendly, uh, from what I've heard, uh, there are uh, like 3,000 um, job that has been um, created here. So just for the It goes back to, just to, as a comment, it goes back to what Andre was saying earlier and to, to Tim. Uh, you, you have to start at a young age. You have to start very, very early for, from a training perspective of what's, what are the skills required. <coughs> By the way, I would say it's, you're never too old. 
but I, I do believe that that gets into a point where, you know, that those are going to be skills that are going to how you learn, how you become responsible, uh, and what it is you do with with blockchain, rather than waiting for you to be a, in a university. So, um, and I think that would be. Uh, I know that we spoke about some projects here in that space, which I find very, very unique, um, just to Andre's vision uh, at, at at a primary to to uh, junior high school level. Um, and so, there's some examples we can take from there. The other thing is, I mean. Um, at, at this point in time, it's this sort of geeky language. I mean, if you program in Python and Python 3, uh, <laughs> JavaScript, and you know, JS, I mean, all of those great languages, uh, having, having had the pleasure of experimenting a bit, uh, those, are, those are, you'll get it, <laughs> pretty, pretty much so. But, um, but, but, but again, it's like creating a, a, a set of, uh, using all of this stuff to create uh, recipes that you would become interesting, especially if I sw switch and pivot to smart contracting, which is yet another uh, set of interest uh, of space. So, so the workforce of the future, there's the skilling part, there's the certification part. Uh, HR would be very, very much targeted. I had a with very similar event like this in Dealsdorf, and uh, we were talking about HR being, in human resources being kind of a, a wonderful uh, target for this. Uh, yeah, so maybe I'd like to add something. So I think actually we're going to see something different in the future when it comes to employment. And I think the best example actually is Kobe for that. Yeah. I actually think that in the future, and through blockchain technology, there will be no longer companies looking for people, but people will look for companies. Yep. So I you will agree. see a complete opposite of yeah. the way we actually. So you see already today, <coughs> anybody have seen it or not seen it, look at Kobe, C O B E E. Um, they basically one of the uh, uh, few marketplaces they're trying to, to reach that year. So you basically have a protection system and you basically you know, have all these skills and whatever it is, programmer and so on. And rather than a company looking for you, you look for the right company for you. And I think this is probably more what blockchain have, has as a potential to, to change the way we're actually um, looking for jobs in the future. Yeah, so I'm just stopping to ask question, and I would like to invite the audience to ask you a question. So who want to start here in the audience? Or comment, please. No worries. <laughs> Don't be shy. Ask me a question. Yeah, I have a basic question. So for example, what some people are saying is the blockchain is you save us a lot of money, you save resources, and so on. We have the same discussion now, and certain kinds of what the digitization and will kill jobs. So how do you face this? That's you actually some four <coughs> people and some companies working there for 20 years and then you come with a new fancy technology and say, yeah, sorry, we don't need you anymore. You can go home. How do you face this? This kind of social aspect. It's actually not a very nice social aspect. Exactly. But this has happened for the last hundred of years, It right? happens and you will so face it again and again. But exactly. the thing is, uh, we were talking about like, the, all the time about these fancy technologies, but what is just the social aspects behind this operation. When we introduce new technology, what are the consequences in our human ecosystem? Should we deal with the technologies as well at some point or think about so, this sometimes? So I have, a, I have sort of a multi multifaceted response because it's a great question. We see it all the time. We've been seeing it all the time. Uh, I go back to email. Could you just uh, repeat the kind of encapsulate the questions? So well, what is so you have the new tech? You have these new technologies that are coming in, and they're essentially disrupting the workforce, yeah. where people are losing their jobs. Right. Okay. okay. This is a common theme that we hear, and so uh, he goes to work, and um, he's given the blow brief, you know, the the, the, yeah. the, the the goodbye paper because his skills are no longer required, and uh, but. But I would say that uh, there's two, one part of it is to be able, you, in a sense, you're responsible for your own skilling. That, that I will say that. We all are. Yeah. You can't depend on an Enterprise X or Enterprise Y to train me. We all are very responsible for keeping up on that curve. On the other hand, um, you know, what's happening is it is, it is going very, fairly, fairly quickly. And I think it's a question to say, look, it goes to, and here's the really big uh, thesis here, that the firms as we know it, they're creaking, they're, they're gonna be different. Um, and so maybe it's, you come in and you go out, you come in and you go out, you go into, you're roving in between other types of entities. And so that, that for me is what I see as the future. 
I know that this has been a topic um, in, in companies where I used to work. You know, you don't have the skill set or we're going to get, but I will tell you, I'm going to argue very, I'm going to be very provocative. A lot of that argument is also on cost of you. So they'll go and get, they'll go and get somebody who is just out of school, maybe, 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 and have your position, and then you get into a cost or, you know, you get into a low cost kind of stuff. <coughs> so I want to say that it's, we're, we're optimistic. We're, we're here. We've seen when the when the when the model Ford was given, you know, uh, when the car was introduced, uh, people thought it's going to, you know, we're going to lose a lot of um, a lot of business, a lot of uh, a lot of workers. In fact, work, more work is created. More work will be created. In the new home. And it's going to be just to look different. Now. Training, I'm absolutely right. The movie, everything always changes. Coming as one again, but I think I missed this social aspect. Yeah, no, the social aspect is really important because the other aspect about, about any of these uh, new organizations that are uh, coming up is um, people uh, want to work for companies that are uh, for benefit or have a social good aspect of it. They're looking at how they treat one another and, and quite frankly there's a group of people who are um, coming into the workforce who are tired of seeing their parents put out the door. So the social good, and, and, and I can tell you this, having spoken to some HR people, they're very concerned about trying to hire new, new hire people, hire people coming, you know, maybe your kids uh, coming into the workforce because of what they've seen, a bloodbath with their parents. And they don't want that. No. I think to be fair, blockchain is the smallest problem. It is. That's that's. I mean, uh, I, I uh, answered so the question in a you, long way. If, if you <laughs> want to, if you want to get some real social uh, distribution, then you have to talk about AI and yeah, what's that's, possible that gets there. Yeah, that's exactly. You're right. But the thing is, that it always comes up in my mind when I see you have to save money, you save cost here. It's much much easier if you don't need. Not everywhere. This is another thing. People always say that, but um, I always <coughs> have been quite bullish. I mean, like. Um, Blockchain doesn't solve any problem, every yeah. problem, right? So many times we have speaking to companies like, well, you can't just do this stupid database, you don't need blockchain for that. Uh, if, so this if, is not a thing. If right? I were to learn lots of new interesting skills, uh, skill sets, I, would, I mean, uh, cybersecurity X is going to be very interesting. Any, any way you want to go, think about attribution of bots versus bots that gets into the AI point. We can go on a long discussion about, uh, about, uh, about uh, new skill sets that are going to be interesting. And how do you declare? How do you know that an attack came from you? So another guard, another another statistic that in 2022 most people will be dealing with the majority of your population will be dealing with trying to deal with fake news. So you know there's there's going to be new skill sets that are going to be required. Anyway. Another question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Right, uh, uh, an old boys club. So what, what can be done now and what's being done to make it more inclusive? <coughs> um, yeah. Uh, I want to answer that. Let me just Very say hard. that. But actually that comes up later in the questions, yeah. uh, the, the gender gap, how can we bridge that or, how, or what can we do in order to, to make sure that uh, this, uh, <coughs> this community is more diverse. and. Uh, a lot of people tend to think that if you want to work in crypto or in blockchain, then you have to be a coder or you have to be in IT. And I think we have to uh, showcase that Validity Labs, for instance, you guys have a marketing department and have other functions where, you know, it's not only about, uh, about uh, having um, to have coding in the and tech experience, but every function. <coughs> actually, we have female coders. Oh, one, one? <laughs> we have, uh, so actually 40% of our workforce is female. And second thing is um, one of the female, so one of the girls, uh, ladies working for us is uh, Alexandra, mm -hmm. and she runs Women Plus Plus. Okay. Women Plus Plus is a tech oriented, female oriented organization, um, which basically does that, brings women to tech. So I think even more. There, there are also various organizations. I'm a proud co-founder of uh, Vips.io. I invite all of you to check that out. Uh, it's uh, Vips.io is for women in blockchain Switzerland. 
and then we focus on uh, three things. Uh, we are a think tank, also uh, focused on, uh, on learning and education, and uh, we have an ambassador program as well, where we showcase ladies from various industries in the blockchain space. Yeah, the thing that I will say is um, just highlighting both of what you're doing in, in Switzerland. This, this is really, really important, and Andre's made it also a point that uh, it's top of, of mind. I mean, how he hires, and Alex is uh, just a star of what she's been doing in, 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 in this space, um, and really, uh, really making it uh, very, very accessible for, for women and people from diverse uh, backgrounds. I think where you're going is uh, what happened in, um, as we all know, in Miami, it was the largest uh, blockchain conference in around February. I think it was 88 sessions, and 85 sessions were all male. <coughs> And then the party was at a circa, I think, and the party was at a strip club. Oh. A three block strip club. And, you know, uh, one of the guys basically said, This is where we were happy, this is where we cut deals. And you can imagine there were quite a few women who were there, and quite a few women investors, and quite a few women technologists, and they were extraordinarily uncomfortable. So that got huge back press. That's what we want to avoid. But I, I also uh, would uh, enhance that uh, blockchain really has a lot of possibilities for not non-coders and all the, the legal aspects I think are, are really, when you look at smart contracts, there are so many possibilities for uh, both genders. And I think the, the IT part, that's as uh, part of the information technology department, uh, we, we have to face. Yeah, I think that's... Um, since years that, uh, that women in IT are underrepresented, not as many, not yeah. as many uh, but we're working on it. So we also have some uh, educational programs for uh, also children uh, to get into this because I think we have to start really early, not when they come out of school, but much earlier. I mean, I took a legal course and I, I found it so fascinating. Uh, I mean, just the hypotheticals that were presented and there were actual cases. Um, setting up when one company comes in and says, oh, I'm going to do an ICO, and they, they had it so, so complex, and which jurisdiction, where are you setting it yourself up, and et cetera. Law is an interesting space for, for people to get more into. And it's the first space that gets disrupted. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Like, two lawyers uh, agree or I'll, interpret the law the same way. Our first, our first customers actually were lawyers, oh, yeah? and we have a lot of them, really lot. Like. So I was invited, and I think one of our first courses was at Hamburger in, in Zurich, the big law firm. We had 85 lawyers in front of us, and they all say to us, what's going to change this for me? Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to lose my job. When is it going to happen? It's like, dude, it's 2016. What's going on with you guys? <laughs> um, yeah, so they actually do understand very early that blockchain could uh, uh, make a big impact on their workforce. But still, they're all there, so it's not that fast. And just to, just to add to that, I mean, the code, I, I'm a career coder, actually. I was a you know, programmer for a couple of decades. And, uh, got to sit with the team who built our smart contract, you know, when they were finalizing it and auditing it. And, you know, the contract itself is maybe a couple hundred lines of code. Yeah. But the number of decisions that go into making that contract do what it does go way beyond the coders. I mean, the, those decisions like, do we allow it to burn tokens, or do we allow it to, what do we do with the last bit of tokens, you know, or, uh, you know, is there going to be uh, rules about how long it will last and what happens if, you know, I mean, there's so many things to consider, and that's just a smart contract for an ICO. So imagine a smart contract for a renewal for a house or for an education uh, program. I mean, there's there's so much more to coding than coding that um, it really, if coding is done well, it has involved a lot of people in a company who made a lot of good decisions. That's what makes good code. So, um, yeah, I think there's a huge amount of room in this, in this new explosion of technology for people who are not technologists to take part. Okay, I have one question from our live recording session live stream on Facebook for Johanna. Sorry, it's going open. So, question for Johanna. How do you see the token wall facilitating education, education in the global fiat space? How do I see? What's, what's the question? How do, you, how do you see the token wall? I mean, you're 
his business card to share and um, first I would like to, to, to say a huge thank you to Andre for hosting here this amazing meetup. You should actually say big thank you to Oda for sponsoring it. And also Oda for sponsoring it. 